You're listening to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, which can be found on our website at treyerwilderness.com and also on iTunes. Welcome to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, where we are homesteading traditionally 100% off-grid today and offering preparedness and survival tips for tomorrow. Here's your host, Tammy Treyer. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to Mountain Woman Radio. I'm so glad to have you join me today. Today is actually a cloudy day. I know I always tell you it's a gorgeous day here in northern Idaho, but today is actually cloudy, and it's actually cool. It's only in the 50s, so it's been a little bit of a shock to our systems because we've had some really nice, sunny, warm days. So today's an inside day, and I'm excited to have a very um, fun guest on and a kindred spirit, if you will. We... um, have such amazing guests lately, and I'm excited to have Jenny Blackmore joining me. She is a blogger and writer and author, and she has so much to share with you. So without further ado, I'm just going to introduce Jenny and let her share a little bit about herself and what she does on her homestead. Welcome, Jenny. Hi. Hi, Tammy. This is so much fun. I just realized you, you're you a mountain woman. I, I guess I'm going to be an island woman, but but not, a, not an, a warm, sunny island. I'm right on the east coast of Nova Scotia here. <laughs> so we're kind of a chilly island. I'm a chilly island woman. How's that? That works. <laughs> that works. <laughs> oh, but... Jenny has so much information and, as she said, is in a very unique location and we found out we have an awful lot in common in chatting before we started recording. And Jenny, if you want to share a little bit about what got you started in your blogging and and writing and and about your location there. Okay, well, oh, about, well, over 20 years ago, I was a single mom and I I decided for some reason I was going to build my own house because I thought that would be cheaper than than trying to rent. And I know that doesn't make any sense, but at the time it seemed to make sense, right? (laughs) So the only, the only piece of land um, that that I could afford to build on was on this kind of rocky little island. um, And I'm probably about, oh, 400, 500 meters from the high water mark. So like, you know, really uh, right on the water. Um, and, uh, and so first of all, managed to get the house built. And then, um, I, I wanted to grow all my own food, you know, and I just thought because prior to this, I had lived in Toronto and I'd been gardening in this beautiful garden that had been gardened for, Oh, a lifetime before I was blessed with it for a couple of years. And of course, I just put seeds in the ground and everything grew and it was hot and it was sunny and there was city water and you just watered everything twice a day, you know, and all this. So I came down here and I just thought that's how you did it, right? (laughs) And so, of course, it was just like one disaster after another. (laughs) And, um, you know, I didn't have any money. Um, and so I was, I had to figure out ways to do it, um, on the cheap, you know, and right. so I had to make my own soil was the first thing. Oh, well, the first thing actually was gathering, um, gathering rainwater because right. the well is no good. And, uh, so first of all, I gathered rainwater, um, and, and sort of the, the whole house is still runs on the, on the same system of having a system in the basement. Yeah. And then I started building my own soil, like using seaweed and leaves and just whatever I could lay my hands on right Right. so I didn't realize it at the time but I was already kind of halfway into permaculture before I'd ever even heard the word about it you know (laughs) and um, so it took a few years definitely took a few years and things were kind of coming along and then a hurricane blew through and it completely decimated it took down every tree right and it was 
carnage. And so for, for quite a while, I, you know, um, I was married by this time, and uh, we, we sort of took the, like, let's ignore it, and it'll go away. You know, and of course, that was about as successful as you might expect. <laughs> and um, so so then we we started, like, slowly clearing up little spots and kind of reclaiming the forest floor. And um, now we have this beautiful little oasis. And uh, so even the hurricane, terrible as it was at the time, it was sort of a mixed blessing because now we have the positive aspects of um, having a lot of room for gardens. And then, of course, there were slugs. That was another um, thing. And somebody said, oh, you know, just get some chickens. They'll take care of it. So <laughs> got chickens. Well, maybe some chickens, but not my chickens. And they just would look and say, you got to be kidding. Eat what? <laughs> and then somebody else said, no, 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 not chickens, ducks. So then we got ducks, right? So by this time, we're sort of interested in heritage breeds. So then we also got geese, and then we got turkeys, and then we got meat rabbits. And and so everything just kind of evolved <laughs> in sort of a quasi common sense kind of way. Yeah. Like it probably didn't make any sense at all to to someone from the city, but it kind of made sense. And and you know the more you sort of study permaculture and getting everything to integrate, it sort of makes a lot of sense now. You know, yeah. still work and yeah. um, you know certainly not getting rich on it, but it's beautiful. And it's really, I think, <clears throat> how we're supposed to live life, you know, because yeah. every day is a surprise and every day is <laughs> something beautiful. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that was the long answer to, yeah, how did it get started? <laughs> oh, that's okay. That was great. I love when people just do that and just go off and share because that's when it's all the most heartfelt information. That was awesome. And I'm intrigued. So as a single mom, you did build by yourself your own home that's awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's very amazing well yeah it was probably not the wisest decision but you know it did work you know so um and I don't regret it I'm sure not. I don't regret it at all I'm sure not I'm sure not because... <laughs> but pri prior to that prior to building the house too um there was like a little cabin on, on the piece of land and um the roof leaked so badly that, like, we used to have to catch the drips in garbage cans, like full-size garbage cans. Yeah. And it was also the coldest winter in, like, 70 years. So you can imagine this. Wow. It, if the water went on the floor, it froze overnight. So you had this, like, inside skating room. <laughs> so another kind of learning curve was um, heat distribution, you know, so I'm like... I, I don't ever want to be this cold again, you know. <laughs> so it made me think about designing, you know, with really good heat circulation. And mm -hmm. and I still have the same wood stove. It's over 20 years now, and that's what we use, and it heats the whole house, you know. Yeah. Um, so I guess every, pretty much every step of the way, it's been a pretty big learning curve. Yeah. Um, but it's all been worth it, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, how old were your children when you when you took on that venture? Oh, they were like uh, fourteen and eighteen. Okay. And yeah, so they were, you know, they were kind of up there. Yeah, the teens. So, so my fourteen-year-old was my eighteen-year-old was not going to have any part of it <laughs> until the house was pretty well finished, and then he's deciding. Okay, I guess mom's crazy idea is going to work after all. I guess I will move in. <laughs> so it was quite a quite a bit. My fourteen year old who who was one. Um, I remember one time they were coming to backfill the foundation, and we had to get the insulation uh, on the basement walls. And there was this massive storm, you know, and it was just like. Like, when we get a storm here, we don't just get rain and a bit of wind. Probably much like you, we get, like, a real storm, you know. Right. And we're going with these, like, sheets of styrofoam sliding down, like, banks of mud, trying to glue them on the walls. And, and my little guy's at one end, and I'm at the other end. And 
we still talk about that because somehow or other we got and we had to get it done that day because they were coming to kind of backfill yeah oh and then there was another storm and it blew the second story right off oh, it hadn't gosh. been braced properly yeah. and it wasn't finished and the wind got inside and just ripped the whole second story right off <laughs> oh wow so yeah there were a few things that it wasn't, yeah, like they were all pretty big learning curves, I guess, <laughs> when I look back. <laughs> but awesome, but you made it through it all, and, and that's just, I, I just think that's really inspiring to a lot of people, because, men and women, because, you know, even with society the way it is today, you know, we are forced to have to embrace things on our own. And, and make it happen. And, and I just think that that's such an amazing story to share uh, and, and will probably help many people today because sometimes we just need to make it happen and, and go against I, the I norm. really believe that. You yeah. know, I just totally believe that if we really want it, you know, yeah. and, and it's a good want, you know, yeah. Yeah. And that's what the Lord wishes. You're going to have it, but sometimes you have to really work for it, you know. Sure, sure. And uh, I'm I'm still working for it because right now I still have a a bit of the uh, wooded area that I'm reforesting, but making it as a food forest. Okay. And so that that's quite a bit of work because there's still some of the old stumps and everything in there. And uh, but you know it's beautiful, and all the birds are coming back and. Yeah, so it's it's a lot of work. Sure, it's a lot of work, but it's kind of fun work. Yep. And I think to myself, like, if I wasn't doing this, what would I be doing? You yeah. know, if I actually yeah. had some free time, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do with it. <laughs> I totally hear that. I totally hear that. Being forced to slow down this year has been challenging for my brain, I think, more than anything else, just because I'm so used to just doing stuff. And so to slow down has been been a challenge and and I'm the same way I enjoy doing what we do and there's so much gratification in that and when you look back there's so much pleasure in the accomplishments regardless if you had a learning curve or not you know that learning curve pushed you forward and you learned through it and now you're you know ahead of the game and building bigger and better things so that's just amazing I would love oh I would love to take a trip to your property <laughs> Well, I, I can always post a few more pictures on my blog, I guess. <laughs> but I think I think one of the benefits too is, I think the closer we're living towards the natural way of things, mm -hmm. um, I think it just makes us happier. I, I think that we're supposed to have a really close connection with our food, for instance. Yep. And, you know, there's been times in the winter, you know, you battle your way out to, say, the chicken shed. And, you know, you just put your hand under a chicken and give them some food. And oh, you can just feel it in your soul, you know. It's just like um, you, you suddenly forget that it's freezing rain and that your feet are cold. And it's just this beautiful feeling. Yeah. And, I, and it, I really think it's sad that so many people are just not living this. Yeah. And if they look at it from the outside and they think, oh, no, that's not for me, that must be terrible having to go out in that storm. But it's really not because it's, I don't know, it's almost magical, I think. I have and the to same with, like, when you put, put, put seeds in the ground. I mean, that's magic. That's like miracles, every single seed, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. And it grows into food, and you feed your whole family, and you give stuff away, and that's amazing. I just love it. I really do. That's so cool. And you're so contagious. I love it. I love your personality and your um, accent as well. It's just very, it draws you in, but it's so true. And, and to be able to produce those things and, and feel that, it's, so, it's something that I think everybody should experience once in their life. I've enjoyed greatly getting my son out in the garden with me, and he enjoys being out there as much as I do. It's just, it's very grounding and just... Um, de-stressing and and we were talking a little bit before we started interviewing in regard to my desire to be in the garden so much this year and I'm just craving it in such a big way but my health isn't permitting me to be out there like I would like to but gosh just a few minutes out there is just utopia 
<laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, I know. Yeah. Well, as, as we discussed, I went through the same thing last year, and it was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> so now it's it's an actual it's it's an honor to pull weeds out. Like, <laughs> ask me at the end of the summer, and I'll be like, no, I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> it's simple pleasures in life, and it's the things that you would consider to be other people would consider to be nagging chores are blessings to us, just because it, you know. I'm sure you don't have to work the nine to five like I desire not to as well. Our nine to fives are on our homestead, but it's different and it's a different level of work. The stress that comes from our work is so different that, you know, I wouldn't even call it stress because there's such a balance in what we're doing and working with the land and working with our animals. And I think I can hear your turkeys in the background gobbling. Is that what I was hearing? Probably, yeah, probably I've got the back door open and there, yeah, that's probably exact. I, to tell you the truth, I don't even hear it anymore. Yeah, there he is. Yep. Yeah. I have a duck. I have a yeah. duck that makes a lot of noise during the day. <laughs> but um, we also raise a lot of our own, um, you know, uh, eggs, like we incubate and so on and so on. And it reminded me of... Um, like last year, I think we're going to try and avoid it um, this year. But we have like two different roosters because we're um, we're breeding Rhode Island Reds and Barred Rock, so we have them ke- kept separate. And we'd also got in um, a batch of uh, meat birds, and uh, we had them on the front lawn in in or oh, lawn. Listen to me, yeah, ha ha, in the front of the house. <laughs> um, in their own enclosure, right? And they were kind of just getting to the point where they were trying to crow. And it, it's if you ever heard of a teenage chicken or to try a teenage rooster, I should say, trying to crow, it sounds like those New New Year's Eve party favor things. <laughs> and I woke up one morning, it was about 4.30 in the morning, and uh, the two adult roosters were having a dissing match and then we had all these things these teenagers out front trying to add making these strange noises (laughs) it was just crazy and i was like wow the peaceful life (laughs) but it's music to our ears right it's just funny i my husband doesn't enjoy the noises like i do it's kind of like having children you know it's just additional children on your homestead making noise but i i I can totally relate when we had our young chickens. That is the funniest sound ever. (laughs) I know. Isn't it crazy? The first time I heard it, I was like, what is that noise? (laughs) What is that noise? (laughs) We thought it was some rare species that had moved onto the island. (laughs) That's so funny. (laughs) I'm going to take a short break here to get in some words from our sponsors. And when we come back, I want to share your book because your book is phenomenal. So everyone stay tuned and we'll be right back. Are you a blogger or author struggling to keep up with the demands of your business? Are you also afraid to hire somebody on in fear of that inadequate person and the struggles that go along with it? Well, look no further. Contact Michelle of mdh-services.com for a reliable, efficient, and trustworthy virtual assistant. Offering editing, manuscript editing, blog post creation, blog work, administrative work, clerical work, social media sharing, and so much more. She's very organized, efficient, and she will always be a step ahead of you. Trust me. So contact Michelle of mdh-services.com and take your blog and writing to the next level. Do you have a loved one or are you suffering from celiac disease or a gluten intolerance? Trying to find that perfect flour? Whether you are baking cookies, flaky pie crusts, or baking breads from scratch, or you are looking for a quick cake from a package, look no further. Better Batter offers non-GMO gluten-free products with an assortment of packaged items as well as flour packaged in varying sizes, including their bulk sizes, perfect for those of you that are practicing your preparedness skills. Better Batter's not just another gluten-free flour. It's what you have been searching for. Visit betterbatter.org. 
Do you have your free digital subscription to Prepare Magazine yet? If not, then hurry over to preparemag.com and start getting each monthly issue sent directly to your inbox. It's easy. All you have to do is go to preparemag.com, enter your name and email address, and you're subscribed. Consider signing up for the premium membership for past issues and exclusive resources. You can even subscribe to the beautiful print version of Prepare Magazine. Visit preparemag.com and choose the option that's most valuable to you. Prepare Magazine, encouraging, empowering, and enriching your journey. Okay, we are back, and again, I am speaking with Jenny Blackmore, and you can find her at quackadoodle.wordpress.com, and it's Q-U-A-K-A-D-O-O-D-L-E.wordpress.com, and again, you'll find all her information in the show notes, but Jenny lives in a very unique location and she, her book is just amazing. It is actually a recommended book by Mother Earth News and it is called Permaculture for the Rest of Us, Abundant Living on Less Than an Acre. And Jenny certainly provided great, great, great information in her book. And Jenny, I would love for you to share um, you know, some of the things you do on your homestead and, and, and how your book came about. Okay, well, I sort of, as things, as things started to improve around here, I kind of realized that, like, if I can do it, anybody can do it, right? <laughs> um, because, of course, the, the, the conditions here are very challenging. Um, you know, I've mentioned the storms, but also the total lack of, of uh, soil. And we, with, with being on an island, we constantly have wind, and we also get a fair bit of fog, you know. So, so there's quite a few challenges. And um, but but when you look out, say probably in about another month. I mean, I'm already eating some amazing salads, nice. and it's only what middle of May. Nice. But um, in another month, it's just like absolutely just abundant. We get so much off off our beds that you know we're, we're giving it away. You know, I'm selling eggs in town, and they can't wait for the rhubarb and all this kind of thing. Nice. And um, the more I thought about it, you know, because people would say, oh, I can't grow because such and such. Oh, my soil is no good, you know, and this kind of thing. And it seemed really sad that people think that it's it's a bigger challenge than it actually is. Yeah. And so um, one of the early chapters in the book is um, telling people the various uh, methods that I use to create garden beds. Um, I, I use uh, a method called hugel culture very, uh, quite often, and that's actually an Aust- uh, comes from Austria um, originally, and it, it, it um, it's, it's sort of layering of various thicknesses of, of rotten wood, and um, and then you put the leaves and straw and so on. But because when the wood rots down, it creates this complete explosion of um, food for the plants um, that the plants just go nuts <laughs> they really do and and also the rotting wood um, heats up quite a bit which in my location probably in your location too um, heating the soil up as quickly as you can is a good thing okay. and so usually about we get about a two week jump on on things in the hugel in the hugel mounds okay. and um, the, there's a guy in Austria, he actually farms sides of mountains, like he does it on an industrial scale, yeah. but he's really got it nailed down, and his name is Sepp Holzer, and, you know, it, he has all kinds of, like, videos and stuff, um, so that's one method we use. Um, we use kind of lasagna beds, you know, just by layering whatever you can get your hands on okay. um, uh, in, in various layers, just like making lasagna, but you're using compost and straw and stuff like that instead of um, pasta and meat sauce, you know. Okay. And uh, that works really, really well. Um, quite often, I just like when, when I was reclaiming the forest floor, you couldn't dig down. You had to sort of build on top right. because even though the trees were gone, there was this massive root system, you know, that you couldn't penetrate. Right. And, um, you know, so I would maybe make squash mounds, which is a great way to do it. It's a wonderful way to start because you can, um, you know, you just make the mound, plant the squash, and just mulch heavily all around. 
And like one area that I did that in is now is the, is one of the richest garden beds. I got about oh, I don't know eight inches deep of this beautiful fluffy soil, you know. Amazing. And it's just a matter of it takes a couple of years, you know, yeah. to do it. Yeah. Even though you can plant the first year, but probably not uh, grow great carrots, you know. You right. need stuff that grows on top. Right. Right. Um, for the first couple of years. Yeah, I think the main key is patience, okay. and I don't have a whole lot of that, <laughs> and so I have learned, yeah, <laughs> I have learned to um, be a little more patient, because every so often, you know, you think, oh, I'm not getting anywhere, <laughs> and it was like something would come and tap you on the shoulder, like maybe a squash vine or something, and it's like, ah, ha, ah, ha, over here, <laughs> and so... Uh, yeah. What kind of trees? And, um, just, what kind of trees? Sorry, go ahead. What kind of trees do you have on the island there where you're located? Uh, mostly spruce. So it really yeah. wasn't that great of a loss when they were all stripped down. Yeah. A tiny little bit of um, maple, but really not very much. And it was very raggedy spruce okay. because basically the whole island is either rock or clay. Right. A very dense clay, okay. and almost no topsoil whatsoever. So yeah. the reason they all went down so easily is because they really didn't have much of an anchor, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and that's why, the, I mean, they grow quite tall, but they're, they're never, you know, majestic, beautiful right. trees. They're yeah. just kind of scrubby, kind of half-dead-looking things. Right. So right. It, in a way, I, I hate to sound cruel, but it was no great loss, really. <laughs> but well, we never would have cut them down, you know, because it's like, oh, I can't cut a tree down. Right, but right. now that they're gone, and they're not really missed as much as if they'd been beautiful, um, you know, oaks or birch or something like that. Right? Sure, sure. And I was curious because we have a lot of clay here and we have a lot of pine here as well. Uh, so mm -hmm. I was just curious because the pine always makes the uh, soil so much more acidic. So, mm -hmm. and the clay is incredibly hard to penetrate or to do anything with. So we have a lot of raised beds also. And I was just curious what you were working with there as far as your, your wood for the um, Hugo culture. Yeah, it, it's surprising actually because it is mostly uh, spruce. Okay. And, um, but we have not had um, an acidity problem. Okay. So I don't know whether it's because, you know, after you've got all the wood down, you do end up with probably maybe a six-inch layer of other mulches, you right. know. Right. So you've got leaves. Um, I get I, I get my leaves from in town. Like I steal them off the curbside, you know, <laughs> when everyone rakes their lawns. Yep. <laughs> and um, so usually after the wood, I put leaves. And then, of course, because we have all the animals, there's right. a lot of um, bedding, you know, spoiled hay, that kind of thing. Yep. Then I put that on. Always a little bit of compost. Yep. You know, compost is like the DNA, I think. You know, yep. you just put that in. Yep. And just, uh, oh, seaweed, lots of seaweed. Um, and we've not had an acidity problem. Oh, which, you know, maybe it's counter, or maybe it's because, like, the, the microbial action is such, yeah. I mean, it just, it's an explosion, it goes nuts. That's well, awesome. maybe yeah. that neutralizes it, I don't know. And yeah. the important thing with uh, Hugo culture is that it, um, it has to rot down anaerobically. Yeah. So, so it has to be without air. Um, you know, as opposed to composters like aerobically, and you want to get as much air in as you can. Right. With with the culture beds, you, you want to have them densely packed. Okay. So I don't know whether chemically something happens there. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's never been. It's never been. And I mean, if you were worried about it, you could always put a bit of limestone on. Yeah, and we have done that already yeah. as well. Yeah, and I was just curious. And the seaweed, I just wondered if that played a role too. But that's really interesting. And thank you for sharing that. And I'm curious too. Do you? You said you do the water catchment. Are you also? You're obviously off grid. Are you using wind or solar on your property? No, no, we're we're not off grid yet. That's okay. the next thing we're working on. Okay. We're sort of collecting for for um, some wind power. We're collecting the pylons for okay. the. Um, 
you know, for the supports. Okay. And we're sort of we're we're sort of looking at going both ways, okay. you know, with some solar and some wind. Yeah. Because on occasion, like last year, we got hardly any fog. Okay. Uh, about two years ago, I think we had something like sixty-eight days of fog. Wow. It was insane, you wow. know, and everyone's get getting really depressed about it, you know. <laughs> Right. But um, it wasn't in all the time, but it, it'll come in and out like within a minute, two minutes, right. you know. Right, right. <laughs> So, uh, and with the you window, probably don't get any fog. Uh, not not so much fog, but we get a lot of overcast days. You know, we're we're yeah. away from the coast, so we don't have the fog so much. But there are some rivers close by, and occasionally, you know, it'll get foggy, but not like what, what I'm sure what you have. But it's nice to be able to supplement with both because when you do have the the fog coming in, you most likely have a little bit of wind enough to provide you with the power. So, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, so that's that's where we're at with that. So, <clears throat> I'm certainly self-sufficient with the water supply, yeah. <clears throat> and um, I, I built a system right into the basement. Nice. Uh, and it's quite a big one, nice. and um, it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful water, and um, you know, some people find it's a hard concept. You know, you've got yeah. this sort of nice modern house and you and, and you're using rainwater <laughs> like it's you know <laughs> and I'm thinking well how much how much more pure could it be <laughs> yeah yeah well it's just funny because people have such a hard time wrapping their head around anything that's different because even with us living off the grid they think we don't have power most of the time where we have power all the time you know so it's just yeah. fu- it's just funny it's just the misconceptions and and just people having a hard time wrapping their head around different things <laughs> yeah and the other thing with collecting water is you know you feel um you have more control over your circumstances for one thing yeah. um but also i think it, it changes your perception like when i lived in toronto you know people would just turn the hose on and wash yeah. their car and and actually even hose down the sidewalks you know yeah. with with clean water yeah. and um I have plenty of water, but but when I first had the system, I used to really monitor it because I I was scared I'd run out. Yeah. <laughs> and it just gets you thinking in the terms of of um, honoring and taking better care and not wasting yeah. such a beautiful resource. Yeah, that's so true. And you it's know, funny. And think- my my girlfriend and I were talking yesterday and saying how you know. When people turn the faucet on, they don't realize, you know, they'll be brushing their teeth and leave it running. And, you know, you learn to guard all of those things. We guard our lights just as much as we guard our water, you know, in the same in the same uh-huh. respect. And, and the only time we really have struggles out here is when we have guests because they've got to adapt their brain to turning the lights off once they leave a room and... And, you know, being a little more frugal with the water because it's just, yeah. I, I think when you have it there readily available to you, you know, you take it for granted. And I, I totally get what you're saying because we choose to be frugal. You know, it, it saves us in the long run in so many ways and it's just a good way to live. Oh, yeah. 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 And I mean, frugal, you know, sometimes people don't like the sound of that word. Right. I, I don't even think it's frugal i think it's more honoring what we have and um yeah. i'm just appreciating it properly <laughs> That's a great rather way to than put wasting it. it yep great yeah. way to put it great way to put it because frugal people do flinch at that you know and i think you're very right and it's just just having a respect for the things that we we utilize on a daily basis yeah and then you think of people in other countries who spend most of their day just walking with a couple of cans to get water. Yeah. You know, I just yeah. can't imagine that. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's a, it's a reality, you know, it's a harsh reality for like so many people yep. that I just don't feel I have the right to waste it, really. Yeah. Yep. Yep, exactly. Exactly. I love your perspective on things. And we are we are running a little bit low on time, but you have so many unique I love this the drawing in your book and how it has your your homestead set up and all of your beds that you have available mm-hmm. on your on your homestead. It's just an amazing way and people don't realize that permaculture is even using your flower beds to provide food. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I think I used to think that, well, a flower bed's a flower bed. You can't put a cabbage in a flower bed, right. you know. Right. <laughs> so right. now it's, it's the other way around. I, I, I put a few flowers because I love flowers. <laughs> I just stick a few in my vegetable bed. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> and, and I like to use herbs. And, and, I'm, and I'm switching now pretty much to... Um, edible flowers you know yes. and that kind of thing so yes. and it, it's just mm-hmm. you know so that you can and teas you know i like making my own teas and you know chamomile is beautiful yes. and when you're working in among it and you touch it there's this beautiful waft of of the smell of chamomile you know yes and just those they're simple pleasures but when you're surrounded with it i don't think there's a day go by that i just don't think wow <laughs> thank you lord <laughs> I, I totally hear you. I totally hear you. I love going out into my garden. I have a nice herb bed, and that came back really nicely this year. And I've got spearmint tea and sage, and um, I've got so many different things growing. And I love just going through and grabbing a leaf and nibbling on it while I'm going through my garden. And it's just so refreshing to be around those things. And and just to also be able to utilize them all, you know, being able to dry. I love doing teas and that as well. And I love being able to dry all of my things and enjoy them in the winter months. And, and I just got done getting clover and dandelion flowers to make jelly. And I just, oh, yeah. I love doing that. I love being out there. And I was, you know, contending with my honeybees. We were fighting over the, <laughs> over the blossoms. <laughs> but I let them get the nectar first. <laughs> But it's just, it's so you haven't had a problem with your bees? No, we've been, well, we lost our hives last year, so I did have to get new colonies this year, mm-hmm. So, but they're really mm-hmm. strong, and thankfully we are, we're back on track again, because I love, I call it my homestead gold, I love being able to have mm-hmm. the honey, and they're right there by my uh, medicinal and, and herb that I have growing in the garden, so it's yeah. re- just oh, such good, good honey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you guys have bees? Are you able to grow- have bees there? Well, I have been told, we have a hive, I have been told that there is not enough foraging okay. on the island and they won't want to sw- uh, fly to the mainland. Mm. Uh, we're going to try. Like we, we have a. My husband actually made a beautiful hive, and um, it's all ready to go. Oh, nice. So we're going to try. Nice. I would have to imagine um, with your own property and all that you have growing there that you'll probably be able to self sufficiently maintain your bees. <laughs> I'm thinking so too, you know, I really am. And I mean, you know, there's lots of wild clover and a lot of wild roses and, you know, things like that. So I don't really see why not. Awesome. Awesome. I'll have to follow your blog and see how it goes with the bees because it's so nice to have that honey for medicinal purpose as well as sweeteners and just, uh, it's just another, and I love watching them work. They are just amazing. Mm-hmm. I'm, but mm-hmm. you'll have to report yeah. back and let us know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd love to chat again in the fall and we can compare notes on how our summers went. I think that would be fantastic. I would love to because, like I said earlier to you, I am going to vicariously live through you this year with your garden because I'm, I can't get out there but in full force, and I'm so I'm just going to live through you. <laughs> Yeah, well, every so often I'll say, this one's for you, Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> this one's for you. <laughs> this week I'm setting up a, a filtration garden. Like we have a, uh, I, I'm not going to get into too much detail because it's not quite, you know, it's a little bit under the radar. Okay. But anyway, I'm setting up a filtration garden. And um, so I'm really excited about that. Oh. And so I'm hoping to sort of blog about it soon. Oh, interesting. And, um, um, you might find that interesting too, and uh, yeah, and, and my uh, forest garden—it's coming right along. We got some exciting new, new plants that we haven't tried before, oh, cool. and I got my tomatillos today. Have you grown tomatillos? I have not. I have not. Uh, have you grown them before? 
Yeah, I grew them um, last year, and I, I, I didn't know what to do with them. We got such a huge harvest, and they're beautiful. They, they're like a little green tomato, or not that yes. little, like a green tomato with a paper case around each fruit. Yes. And you you make this uh, wonderful um, salsa verde. Okay. And I thought it was just for Mexican food, but no, it's beautiful with fish and all kinds of things. Nice. Everybody's crazy about it so I had to make sure and plant that but the other thing was I was making the stuff like crazy we didn't know whether we'd like it or not so I, I still had all this green stuff left over so I made mincemeat for Christmas oh, wow. so I made instead of because my mother always used to make green tomato mincemeat oh, yeah. and so I made tomatillo mincemeat and it's it's delicious it's even nicer than uh, green tomato <laughs> Oh, nice. Miss me, so oh, how yeah, nice. and they are—they're beautiful to see. They're—they're they're so cute when they grow, and they look like little Japanese lanterns in a way. Oh, cool! Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> and I, yeah, I think that little paper lining on them is so unique. It does look really different. I've never grown them. I've eaten them many times before, but. We have a short growing season, so tomatoes are hard for me to mm -hmm. get right before the seasons change. Do you have a longer season? Mm -hmm. No. Well, it depends. Okay. It really does depend. Now, this last year was an incredibly short season, but for some reason they did very well. Okay. Our ground cherries, sort of similar but tinier, they didn't ripen, okay. whereas the year before we had scads of them, right? Yeah. Um, now this year, fingers crossed, it's going to be a long, a longer season because we've had beautiful warm weather for about a week and a half. It's still being a little cold at night, okay. but it's really warming up. Nice. So hopefully we'll get a long season. Our falls are beautiful, and nice. with us being by the ocean, the ocean takes the frost away. Nice. So we tend to get a much later frost date. Oh, cool. Very you know, cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that, I didn't think that's about a that. plus. Yeah, I didn't think about yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's a plus. Nice. Um, but even at that, you know, I mean, the days are shorter, okay. you know, so you're still kind of losing in one sense. But right. Right. it seems that the plants know and they're kind of like, oh, just let me check my watch. No, no, it's October. <laughs> we don't grow no more. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I hear but, you. Um, I hear you. But not having the frost <laughs> is nice. That way you don't have to worry about putting, you know, things over your beds and everything. Because that's been my struggle as I lose things to the frost if I'm not careful because our our seasons switch so fast, but but I'll have to ch I'll have to check out the uh, tomatillos and see how they would grow here. I never thought I never mm -hmm. considered trying them here. So next year I will do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, try them. Yeah. Yeah. We usually do that every year. We usually try something new. Yes. You know, we have all the old standards and, and the staples, you know, yep. and things that we know will grow and um, things that we know we love. Yep. <laughs> and um, we like to try a couple of new things. Like one thing we tried were, um, oh, they were supposed to be Chinese wing peas or something they were called. Okay. And they had this glowing description. I was like, oh, and they were really sweet when they were growing. And we couldn't wait to try them. And it was like eating cardboard oh. with bristles on. <laughs> <laughs> they were awful. <laughs> and never was so disappointed. <laughs> well, at least you so, got the yeah, pleasure of we'll... watching them grow anyway, that they looked nice while they were growing. But, yeah, that does happen. Yeah, they were, <laughs> they were really sweet. But I don't know where the descriptions are coming from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. And and you know what it's it's part of the process and learning what you like and what grows in your area and and figuring out what you need for your family as well as part of the process so it's just really awesome it's also awesome to have people like yourself who is is willing to share all the details that's what's really nice about Jenny's book her book is really detailed it's in in layman's terms, it's very easy to understand, and the word permaculture scares a lot of people because they don't understand exactly what it is, but it's basically just growing and utilizing all of your land in varying ways, whether it's for a food forest, whether it's for a what used to be a flower bed is now your your uh, lettuce bed, and, and just 
uh, being able to really condition your soil and learning how to work your soil. And Jenny covers all of that in, your, in her book very well. And I really feel that you guys would benefit greatly. Again, it's called Permaculture for the Rest of Us, Abundantly Living on Less Than an Acre. You can find uh, the details on it in the show notes. And if you go to treyerwilderness.com slash permaculture, it will take you directly to her book as well. For those of you that are on the air and, and surfing via your uh, mobile devices. So, but Jenny... We're running out of time, but I thought maybe you might want to give some encouraging words to those that are new to permaculture and starting to get involved in gardening, and even for those out there that might be discouraged, because we've all been there. <laughs> well, yeah, I would say um, permaculture really, when it boils down to it, is just so much common sense. It really is. Um, like I said at the beginning or talk, you know, a lot of it I'd fallen into just by figuring out, like, how am I going to do this? I guess one of the, uh, it's a set of principles, but I think my favorite principle is, uh, you know, there's no problems, there's just creative solutions. Yeah. And I love that because it means that, you know, you figure out your own way to do it. It's not like you must do this and then you must do this and then you must do that, you know. Yeah. It, it gives you the tools to figure out what will work best for you. You know, and everybody's different, you know. Mm -hmm. And I love the creativity, the flexibility. Um, I, I, and, and one thing I would like to say is that when you're reading most of these books, you see, like, the best case scenario. You know, people don't really often take photographs of the worst case scenario. <laughs> and so I think sometimes people tend to look at it and think, oh, my goodness, mine doesn't look like that. Right. <laughs> and probably theirs doesn't either most of the time, you know. <laughs> so I think that's the other thing to always keep in mind. There's going to be failures, you know. There always is. But there's also going to be, like, shining success. I think that's, I mean, like, even every year, like, things that grew perfectly one year, they're disappointing the next year. And I think it's just um, having that mental flexibility, too, to just ac accept what happens each year, you know, as part of the surprises, and to be patient. Yeah, definitely to be patient. <laughs> I think that's a challenge for all of us, Jenny, not just you. <laughs> uh, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed our time together, and you mentioned about coming back on in the, in the fall, and I mm -hmm. think that is a great idea, and uh, we are going to definitely do that because I think that'll be really fun to uh, share how we progressed and, and you know, and even go over some of the things that we failed on and some of the things that we were successful on and, and to give a little bit more of an eye opener on, on, on things. So that would be fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. And it's been really nice talking to you, Tammy. It has been. And have a wonderful summer. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Actually, well, in closing, you were, you were saying about being frustrated by your, um, not being able to do as much as you wanted to. Yes. If you go to my blog site, there's one posting that's the best way ever to shovel out a goat shed. Okay. And you'll you'll it, you will be able to identify with it. Okay. It's when I I couldn't do anything and my neighbors all came over. Oh, awesome. Um, as a complete surprise and made me sit with a sun hat. <laughs> and strawberries while they shoveled out the goat shed for me. <laughs> oh, and I, I have to imagine you are like I am, and that was the hardest thing, but at the same time you felt so extremely blessed by that. But that's so hard to sit and watch other people work when we enjoy doing our work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I will go check that out today because there are days where it frustrates me. Other days I just I rest in it, you know. I, I'm trying my hardest yeah. to just rest in the peace and in the place that God has me right now and just taking refuge mm -hmm. in it. But, you know, there are those days and we're only human and I appreciate you sharing that. And like I said to you earlier, I think that there was purpose in God connecting us together because maybe I needed some of your insight for my journey. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's a maybe that's an equal swap because <laughs> I'm sure we can be good support for each other. 
I agree. And thank you so much for inviting me. Yes. It's been really fun. Likewise. Likewise. And everybody, thank you so much for listening today. I hope you got something out of this. I'm sure you did. Jenny is a wealth of information, and I look forward to having her back on. And she's just very inspiring. So, folks, take care. And until our next show. God bless. You're listening to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, where you will learn something new every week. We hope you enjoyed the show and encourage you to join us at treyerwilderness.com. And be sure to connect with us on iTunes. Remember, your reviews on iTunes are very important to us and help us reach more people just like you. 